Hi, it's MA. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm trying a new way to record off of my computer. So let's see what happens. So we're going to do some new decks that are mostly not re new releases, a couple of little crafty items, and then just a little ramble about um, ancestral magic and family artifacts, tangible artifacts. So let's look at some decks. Um, so my birthday was last Friday. And the first three things I'm going to show you have nothing to do with that. So I don't even know why I mentioned it, but I did. Um, anyway, so probably last month or whenever they were being mailed out, um, I got the Green Glyphs Lunar Bond. That's the only one I backed from the Green Glyphs Kickstarter. I could have just bought it at the time. I don't know why I did the Kickstarter. I think it actually because I wanted to wait. Um, and I didn't want to get it too soon. So I backed, I've got like a lot of reflection here. Um, so I backed it. And this is my first Lernemond. Lernemond. And what I decided to do, I'm not regard paying any regard to the book every day since I've got it. And I only have four cards left to go. When I'm doing my morning readings, I pick one card at random. I did shuffle it. I pick one card and I just write down what do I see? What are my associations? And then after that, I go and look at the associations in the book. And I wish I had taken the time to do with that with tarot. So I'm looking at these, um, not knowing anything and just writing and just, you know, spontaneously jotting something down. And I'm finding just doing that exercise in itself. Sometimes I come up with the meanings that are the learn them on meanings. And sometimes I'm out in left field and it's completely different, but I'm getting used to that process of letting myself have like a, a thought about like a, you know, an, a free association, a fast association with an image or an object. And so, and kind of in connection with that, what I ended up doing. So like many people, I have the literary witches tarot, um, not tarot, the Oracle. And I've had it for a number of years and I did get to the point, I did trim the borders, I made the deck smaller and I've gotten to the point where I kind of separated out the objects and the authors and the authors I use kind of in my writing practice or as like a, a devotional card and the objects card, I don't know what I was, I wasn't doing anything with them. So I took them out and I trimmed them, trimmed them down teeny tiny and I've started throwing these, you know, when I do my card, when I do my card draws in the morning, it's usually with a guided question. And I usually pull three tarot, one Oracle, and then I've been throwing one of these on and um, just getting used to that, um, you know, thinking of an association and then seeing how it goes with the reading and seeing if the image resonates with anything else in the reading. So I'm really happy I do that. And this was like, um, it was like getting a new deck because I wasn't using it. And I was so, when I first got it, I wasn't even really, I haven't even really done much tarot study. And so I was very locked into, well, what does the book say? What does the book say? And um, I almost didn't keep it. And now I'm very glad I did because it's kind of adorable and little and it just slots in really well with other cards on the table. So that's cool. So free deck, right? Well, I mean, I bought it at some point, free deck. Um, and then maybe last month, I randomly got a package in the mail and it turns out it was from my sister who sometimes randomly comes across a deck somehow or somewhere and sends it to me. And this is the Stitchery Witchery Tarot, which I had not seen anyone talking about. And it is by, if I look really tiny, it says Queenie Black. 2021 on the box and it is someone that's on instagram and that's good it's a sewing it's a sewing theme deck with a slight like victorian spooky vibe as we can see from that vibe um that's the card back with the skull and the scissors and the roses and the thread it's kind of cool the i'm not sure we're going to be able to get this yeah there we go um the edging is holographic like stars and it's pretty cool i've never seen one like that before it's a pippy deck and it's very shiny the cars are a little big and a little shiny 
and it's Pippi. And I think the courts kind of feature around this mannequin figure and the, um, you know, the majors are more traditionally illustrated. So here's some, some Pippi things. Um, I think I got a little confused at once. I think the, the needles are wands. And I would have thought, you know, when I first saw just a needle, I thought swords, but then the scissors are swords and the chalices are cups and something is, oh, and buttons are pentacles or discs. I'm just gonna try to pick out a couple more majors. Um, uh, yeah, well, anyway, it's a cool deck. I haven't really, I haven't, I've barely looked at it. Um, but, you know, she's, for some reason, she saw it and thought of me and sent it to me, which was very, very, very sweet. So that's what I need to play with. I need to play with it. Um, I did a little video that the Black Salt Tarot uh, by Logan at Larkin Legend arrived. So I um, used that a little. I need to, I want to put aside like a week each to kind of use the decks I haven't used much yet for my daily readings. Okay. So then I got sucked into the Llewellyn sale, uh, the deck sale, just because I felt like it. And, you know, it was a little treat for myself. I've mostly been not buying decks or I've been waiting and making much fewer purchases, but I have been backing a few Kickstarters now and then and just waiting for stuff to arrive um, because I've gotten a little fussy. But I did get four decks from the Llewellyn sale and two are tarot and two are oracle. And for the most part, I got them for particular reasons. And uh, for the most part, they are not in my comfort zone. They're not necessarily aesthetically what I would normal pick, normally pick, but I bought them for reasons, as one might say. So the first one I decided to pick up is the Tarot of the Hidden Realm. This has been a while around for a while. I'm sure people have seen it. Um, first of all, the whole Fey thing, totally not into it. So I, 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 there is a point. I will, I will get to the point. Um, I think the the figures are drawn for the most part pretty nicely. There's a couple where the proportions are off. Like a lot of these kind of decks, I actually prefer the cards where there are not people, but those seem mostly to be the aces and a few other cards. Um, and I think ultimately um, the reason I may not keep this is that it's very people-y and I tend not to do as well where a lot of the cards feature a person's like facial area and I'm supposed to read that. Um, for many reasons that doesn't work so well for me i think the most people deck that i'm able to read pretty well um because i relate to how the the characters are depicted in a way that makes me get the vibe of the card is the sasa burrito um but i do have someone in mind that i will probably pass this along to after i've done um done my time with it um and the reason is first of all it was deeply discounted you know it's a, it can be a rather i mean it's sells for $32. I think maybe on the sale it was around 20. Um, and I know I have not worked with a deck where Barbara Moore was involved. And I've heard some people say they love her decks and some people say I don't like them. So I wanted to work with one and kind of read through a guidebook where Barbara Moore was one of the creators. And so that's why I picked it up. And especially because I know someone that's going to enjoy this, but I mean, I could have just bought it for them, but you know, I wanted to read the book. So this is one where if it doesn't work out for me, it it does have somewhere to go. So I'll leave it intact. A lot of times with mass markets, I throw away the boxes or I recycle them. But okay. So then the other chair I got completely completely not my thing at all. And I bought it specifically for that reason. It's very cheap. It's a mini deck. Um, totally not something I would have bought, but I kind of bought it for it being so far out of what I find appealing. So I bought the Gilded Tarot Royale um, by Ciro, whether it's Marchetti or Marchetti, I don't remember. Um, you know, that over the top style, I think of it as like, and I'm sorry, like, 
if you love these, that's great. And I, I do kind of enjoy the craziness and zaniness and over the topness of it, but I feel like it's, um, it, you know, tarot decks for people that would have a gold toilet or like a monogrammed gate in front of their house. Um, but you know, just the crazy colors and the fact that, I mean, this is a teeny weeny, teeny weeny deck. I mean, you know, I have smallish hands and it's in my hand. Um, it's a small deck. I love to throw a deck in my bag. I feel like um, because this is on smaller cards, I can deal with this kind of gaudy imagery a little better. I don't think this is the flashiest of his decks. And, you know, I've just been kind of playing with it and throwing the cards down. It's good for a large spread. It's good for um, cafeteria at work, which is where I've been reading sometimes and reading for people at my actual desk in corporate America investment banking job. Um, so that's fun. And I think there's minimal, I'll go through it again, but I don't think there's, I, I think this also is a, a deck that's good. Um, it's not like if, if someone doesn't know tarot, it's not like the stereotypical imagery that they're going to instantly know what the card is or have like a preconceived notion of the idea because there's just so much going on and it's so bright and crazy. So that was just a fun little thing. It was under $10 in the sale. And um, I just wanted to see, I wanted to test it out. I wanted to take it for a ride literally in my bag. Cool. And I got two Oracle decks. None of them are really new releases. I was drawn to them from, don't even remember why, but um, I did pick up the Kyle Gabron, the Prophet Oracle. Um, this is someone who's right. I think I did watch Robin um, at Total Terrors. I watched his review from like three years ago before I did decide to buy it. And yeah, I agree. This book, this um, this writer, like their that book, The Prophet, was like everywhere in the seventies. Um, I'm not sure why it had such popularity then, but I do have a coworker who just went to an exhibit and saw some of their work and really loves this writer. It's also someone I've been reading for frequently. So I just thought I'd give this deck a try. And um, I haven't gone through it in full detail, but what I do like it is that the text, um, the text for it has phrases from his writing as the text. And they're a little bit cryptic for the most part, which I do love an Oracle with kind of an oracular text message on them. And underneath there's a smaller keyword um, which I find it very easy. And some of the cards are landscape, which is a little weird, but that's okay. Um, and I find it very easy to not attend to that kind of explan explanatory note. Yeah, so let's see, let your best, let your best be for your friends. Pleasure is a freedom song. So yeah, I think this would be an interesting one to use with some of my readings. I really, really, really love the backs of these cards. They're pretty big, uh, you know, big oracle size. They're the size of my whole hand. And again, discounted in the sale, worth a try. Again, I really do like oracles that have kind of a cryptic um phrase on them and not just a keyword so I thought that would be cool and the last one that I got particular for particular reasons is the Into the Lonely Woods um I wasn't really drawn to this when I came out I don't know why and I'm not sure I am now but there's like I don't want to be a crybaby <laughs> I'm not really a crybaby but I have some heavy stuff going on in my life right now and as I am balancing that with bringing in more joy and fun and pleasure, um, because I basically have a master's degree in avoidance and disassociation, I need to stay in touch with some of those heavy things and be present for them. And I thought this would be a good deck to work with for that. I wasn't initially attracted to these kind of lumpy figures. Whoops, I flipped some of it around. But then I was like, you know what? That's what it feels like in my body. Um, so I think there are times when I need to acknowledge and go back and visit some of that stuff that's going, that I'm dealing with and, um, and be present with it. And I think this is like a grounding, you know, I'm kind of planning to use this as a kind of grounding way to almost like visit with 
um, some of that stuff. Now the box says blessings and messages for times of solitude and isolation. That's not really what my situation is. It's more of a grief situation, um, which is a prolonged situation. And, um, but I think it still works. And I've pulled a couple of cards. This is one, I don't really necessarily pair oracles with tarot readings. I mean, I do, and I don't. Um, I think with these, it may just be a case where I just pull a card and sit down with it. Or if I'm doing a reading on, on that subject, I might pull one of those cards because it's pretty specific, right? I'm not going to just say, oh, this week, I'm going to throw one of those sad cards on all my morning readings because because why would I do that to myself? Okay, um, speedy chat about some crafty things. I've been very inspired. Giselle over at Mad Witch has been had been doing some concocting in the kitchen. And um, I found the moments and the opportunities to do some smaller things as well, which is, um, I had a spray that came in a, in a box and the container was empty. And I said, let's reuse it. So I made a sleep spray that I craftily called Nighty Night Sleep Spray. And yeah, I used some essential oils. It's got lavender and amethyst and mugwort in it. It looks a little murky. It's all floating in some frankincense hydrosol that I had. <clears throat> Smells good. This was fun to test these things out and test the formulas out. I've tried to get better about writing it down and dating it. So I know if it worked, I can replicate it. If it didn't work, I can test different amounts of things. So that was fun. I get some incense from Sea Witch Botanicals in the US that I really love. I love their incense. It's not, I mean, I don't find that the scents have as wide a range, but I find that they're not choking and um, I can really use them and they feel pleasant. And they're, a lot of them have a very earthy vibe. And one of my favorite ones is called Hermitage. And I have bought the spray, like once a year, I'll buy one of their sprays and it lasts me a whole year. It's very um, well scented, but the Hermitage is patchouli and lavender and citrus and one other thing. But I had those essential oils. So I made my own oil blend. Um, based based on the combination of scents that are in that incense. I don't do well with labels. Hey, you people that make this stuff, like how do you get the labels to stay on? This one is like floating around, all my oil stuff. At least I did use a permanent pen this time, but I can't get the label to stay on. Yeah, so this smells great. Reminds me of the incense, which I also love. And then the last thing I made, um, whenever I have these little dainty little, you know, containers that come from other people. I saved the container. So I, this tube was from, I don't I think it was a floor sweep that was in here. So I repurposed it. I made a face, face scrub and all that's in it is lavender and dried roses. And I chop, I blended them into a powder in my food processor and mix it with brown rice flour. And so when I go to use this face scrub, I just mix it with a little rose water a few drops of a facial oil and you know I use it maybe like once a week not more than that and I keep in the refrigerator brown rice flour can go off or get rancid and you know get cooties or get moldy if I keep it in the bathroom so I do store it in the fridge for freshness as pretty much most of the toiletries I make that aren't 100% oil or don't have um you know other going to try to keep a long time so yeah so th it's just been really fun to like spontaneously say oh I feel like making something and sometimes I'm just inspired by what empty container did I save and that will tell you know kind of guide me along what kind of thing because I was making some salves and I almost am out of my I'm almost out of the hand cream I made last year which this is how classy I am I didn't even take the label off the recycled jar which was someone's hot chili oil <laughs> you have to be careful at my house because you'll come across a container that says one thing and it's got something completely different in it. So don't eat this and don't put the hot chili oil on your hands probably. Okay. The last stuff I have 
Um, so my mother's house is um, on the market being sold. It's currently in contract and we're in the process of emptying it out, which anyone that's gone through that or even moving out of your own house, it's a lot. Um, you know, she's been in that house since 1978. Her, she and my father were both only children. So they have also have a lot of their parents stuff in the house. It's a small house. You know, there's not a lot of fancy stuff in it. Um, but there's a lot of like little things, right? So we've been trying to figure out what, what to try to sell, what to donate. Um, and I think the assortment of things that I, and, and I've, I'm trying to minimize myself to a very, very small box of things. And over the years, I have brought a few things home that my mother said, you should take this, you should take this. Um, what no one wants is the Hummels, the China, the silver, crystal goblets. Why did my parents, why did my family even have these things? I mean, considering their, you know, the economic circumstances that they grew up in and we grew up in, I was at their home my mother's in assisted living now. I think I mentioned this. Um, I was there with my daughter and we were laughing about all the times we sat on the mahogany white used dining room table, eating off um, plastic plates that were meant to be disposable, but got rewashed while we're staring at a cupboard full of, you know, fancy crap that no one ever used. But, you know, they were upwardly, upwardly mobile, lower. They were raised as upwardly mobile, lower middle class people whose parents had factory jobs and had, you know, aspirations for their kids to, you know, at least give the appearance. And that's how, that's how they did it as they, you know, they did it with things. Um, so now those things, nobody wants, but I'm just going to share with you some of the things I have brought back um, as kind of, you know, we're, we're getting into the spooky season and, you know, ancestral times. And I, when I take things, I'm trying not to take things that are tchotchkes, but I've, I've brought things back that I think have space in, um, magical practice and, you know, ancestor stuff is complicated. Um, it's complicated for a lot of reasons for me. Maybe I'll talk about some other time. It's not like deep, dark, heavy stuff, but, um, whatever it's weird stuff. Right. So here's a couple of things I've brought back over time. Um, and maybe if you're going through somebody's house, you know, it's just like to have those eyes on things and say, oh, I can use that for whatever. So I'm not a knitter. My mother's mother and my mother were very serious needle workers at some point. Um, so there's a lot of vintage knitting needles. And as much as I thought, oh, I should take them all. No, I should not. Because when am I going to suddenly take up knitting? I have, you know, arthritis in my hands and no time. So I kind of had to let that go and say, if I'm ever going to knit, I'll get some knitting needles. What I did take is a few of these um, vintage, they're like aluminum with color over them, double-ended needles. I don't know what they're for in knitting land, but I've been using them for um, candle scribing and for like if I have um, loose incense or things that I need to stir around while they're hot. I've been using these and I feel like, you know, having this be a family object kind of adds to the magical practice of it. Um, my mother in, in the seventies, this was a thing in the U S embroidery got really popular, real embroidery. It was just like a big thing. It was very popular. You would buy the kits with the stamped picture and like, you know, sew over it. Um, at some point, my mother made this very kind of almost like a sampler of different kinds of stitches. And it was made into a pillow top. The thing is very threadbare now and rather filthy. Um, the pillow was just disgusting. So I cut, I cut this off. I always have been fascinated by this squirrel with the fluffy tail. I mean, look at the cuteness, the grapes, the flowers. I mean, it really just is a really cool, oh, the bumblebee. It's just a cool piece of needlework. So I'm going to try washing that and see what I can use it for. You know, just a little table covering. Um, it's Alan if I put like a little offering dish down. Okay, so that's another thing. Um, this is like a little small, you know, remnant. What do we call them in fabric? It's a remnant of some wool. I don't know if you'd call it serge fabric or whatever kind of fabric it was. Um, so where my parents grew up, where I grew up, it used to be 
um, just filled with textile mills. I mean, that's where everyone worked. They worked in the mills. And this is fabric that uh, my grandfather was, you know, works the loom machines. And this is fabric that um, he brought home from work. Apparently he used to be able to buy odds and ends of fabric um, from, from the factory. And he would go have pants made um, and was very snobbish with my mother about any fabric clothes of any clothes she bought. And this is just like, I mean, this fabric is probably from like 1950. This stuff is 80 years old and it's gorgeous. It's been in a cedar chest, but um, anyway, there, we had several relics like this and some my brother returned to a local museum of, of the textile industry there. Um, okay, here's some other weird doodads. I have two of these. Um, this is apparently beading that my grandmother at one point had on like a flapper dress and, um, you know, very sad to us. She threw those clothes away um, before we could tell her not to, but because she couldn't help herself, she saved, she saved the beading. So I'm not sure what I'll do with these, but at some point, um, clothes are definitely worth rescuing. Um, this kind of aluminum stuff was very popular, 40s, 50s, 60s. This is a nice flat tray. And when I was preparing the house for sale, when no one was watching, um, I did some workings in the house and, you know, I was able to put candle and some other things on here. So this is a great for spell use. And then two other little tchotchkes. Again, this is the stuff that's really not worth any money, right? And if someone else's eyes had gone through all these things these would have been some of the first things to be to be chucked into the donation bin especially the things i'm going to show last so i guess you'd call this like a frozen charlotte right the the cheap old bisque dolls um it says japan on the back this one does have color a lot of those i've seen are white you can see where this little dolly's head has broken off and been glued back on with just like the worst mucilage hoof paste, you know. Um, if I remember correctly, and I'm not sure I do, I think that this little thing was sitting in a potted plant in, in my Nana's house. And that's where I remember it, is from being, being in a potted plant. Um, and her landlord was named Mr. LaPlante. And we used to call the dolly Mr. LaPlante because it was in a plant and we thought we were being extremely funny. But it has, oh, it also broke. It's also broken here and been smashed back together. I mean, it's almost literal garbage, right? But when I saw this thing, I was like, oh my God, it's Mr. LaPlante. So it came on with me. It's like, think of all like the plant energy. It's like soaked up with my Nana watering the pot. I mean, it's just cool. And the last thing is even the last thing is even weirder and even more broken. Okay. Can we just enjoy this for a minute? This is a candle. Um, its head has come off and I had to kind of melt it and stick the head back on. You can see this is kind of the wick coming out the back of its head. I don't think the candle has ever been lit, or if it was, it was lit for like, let's see, it was lit for like one second and blown out so we wouldn't ruin the candle. I can tell you, I remember what this candle was from as soon as I saw it. When I joined the Brownies, which is like the junior version of the Girl Scouts, and I would have been seven years old. So we're talking about like 1968. This is a 55 year old candle. And they gave us each a cupcake that had a candle on it. And I didn't want to ruin the candle. So for some reason, this little creepo of a candle ended up in the back of my mother's china cupboard next to some you know fancy shit and i freaking love it i love this cre it is so creepy it is so delightful and now it's my poppet and i um i'm doing some stuff with it um about my about some of the roots of my procrastination and resistance to organization so this little this little dolly you know we're doing some magic together and I'm so happy I found it. So yeah, I thought that was just kind of fun that um, the stuff that I found that I really wanted was 
just not really that valuable to anyone else except me. And like I, a couple of things I took that, you know, my sister remembered too. And it's just, it's kind of fun stuff that has, that has meaning. And um, my kids will probably chuck in the garbage as soon as I'm not around to tell them not to. So that's that. That was my little birthday deck binge and shopping the mother's house and magical crafties. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye.